This is One on One. It is our honor to welcome uh, Southside Johnny from Southside Johnny, uh, Southside Johnny the Asbury Jukes, the creator of, you know, it's, it's called the, uh, they say the Jersey Sound, but you like to call it Jersey Soul. Yeah, I don't know if there is a Jersey Sound. I mean, everybody's a little bit different. Some people are a lot different. You know, there's a lot of bands, but I think there's a certain blue collar, chip on the shoulder ethos that goes through most of the music. You know, being from New Jersey it was the joke state. Uh, Johnny Carson would make jokes about New Jersey and everybody else did and it made us much more aggressive uh, and much more determined to prove that we were worthwhile. Bon Jovi said, uh, you are his reason for singing. He always blames me. He blames <laughs> me for everything. <laughs> what a great compliment. Yeah, it's, it's nice of John. I mean, I think that he was, when I first met him, he was like 17 years old, but he was bound and determined to be in a band and uh, he made it work, so mm. a lot of that is his just plain determination. What was going on down at the Jersey Shore? I mean, you grew up, we were just talking right before we got on the air, you grew up in Ocean Grove, mm -hmm. not Asbury Park, not Long Branch, but this little town, Ocean Grove, which is a, I'm trying to figure out, is it, is it Methodist? Yes, Methodist. Uh, the Methodist camp. Big party town, huh? <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's still no uh, uh, liquor stores in town. They have li uh, li lightened up a little bit. You can actually bring your own bottle to some of the restaurants. But right. when I grew up, you couldn't have any liquor on the street or have it. I did a Miller beer commercial in the 70s. Right. And my mother and father were still alive and they were still living in Ocean Grove. And of course, uh, you're not supposed to have any alcohol there. So one of the perks from the Miller beer commercial was a case of beer a month. I don't drink that much beer, so I had it delivered to my mother's house, my mother and father's house. And this little car would pull up and the guy would open the truck and I'd come out with two cases of Miller beer and deliver it and all the neighbors would go, oh. You were mother, breaking the rules. I was breaking the rules. Well, they were. They, I, they I, were, I, no, I no, no, that's right. <laughs> um, but you influenced Bruce, you influenced. Um, um, I think we all influenced each other. What, that was such a cauldron of music back then. In Why? The, in this, well, everybody wanted to be in bands because it was a way to, get out of having to decide what you needed to do for your career, you know, to, to make some decision. We were all under a lot of pressure. This is the time of the draft, the Vietnam War, and people were saying, you've got to go to college or you're going to go to Vietnam. And I didn't want to do either one of those things. Right. Uh, and so we, we kind of got involved in music because we loved it, of course, but also because it gave us something to do to say we're doing something. Was the Stone Pony... No, it was, that was Mrs. J's back then. Um, we had the, uh, uh, what was the name of it? The Upstage Club. But which, so the Stone Pony came later? A, a little bit later, yes. There was a place called Mrs. J's, which was is it hot? the Stone Pony. Was yeah, it there were deal? bands there, but there were the older bands. Mm. The, uh, uh, Jay Walkers and uh, Cherry Bomb and the Aztecs and those kind of bands. And, but did, let me ask you this. When it exploded for you, because the, the, the song that everybody knows you from, uh, I Don't Want to Go Home. By the way, you ever get tired of singing that? No. Because? When it starts. Your signature song, go ahead. It, the crowd gets up. They can't wait to hear the song. And you're cued into the crowd. And if the crowd is really having a great time, you're having a great time. So it doesn't bother me. And you connect with the crowd. Yeah. Uh, we're doing this, by the way, in early December. You mind if I plug New Year's Eve? <laughs> do, do you mind? No, if I, 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 I'm going to let you do it this once. But just this it. once. Yes. This is PBS. We don't like to do that, but I'll do this just this once. I, I really appreciate and it. And you're a big fan of PBS. I know that. Yes, I am. New Year's Eve show, State Theater. New Brunswick. New Brunswick, New Jersey. And also January 9th at the legendary B.B. King's. That's right. We are playing B.B. King's, too. It's a great place to play. What's up with you guys in New Year's Eve? I, you know, it kind of just descended upon us. We used to do it at the Capitol Theater. For sake. Yes. And we did it there for like 15 years, 18 years. And then John did... Shear there at the time? Yes, wow. John yeah. Shear, yeah. And uh, then we did it in Red Bank at Count Basie Theater. And this year we're doing it at the State Theater in New Brunswick. I've had one New Year's off in 40 years, 35, 40 years. And that was the year Steve Van Zant decided to get married in New York City. <laughs> and I had to go into New York City for New Year's and, and go to his wedding where Little Richard was the preacher and right. Percy Sledge did the song. And it was just Must a great have been night. A scene. It was bizarre. Talk about your wonderful. relationship with uh, Stephen Van Zandt. He and I, uh, 
always connected through music. When I first saw him, he was playing, uh, I forget what kind of, hit, but just really intense blues rock. And that, of course, was what I was doing too. So we hooked up and we had a number of bands. We played acoustically, just him and I. Um, I had a house with my first wife and he moved in there. He was working on the turnpike, believe it or not, working in Jackhammer on the turnpike. This great guitar player ruining his hands. And finally I said, you know, you can't, can't do that anymore. I mean, it was great money, but right. this guy is a brilliant musician. He's a brilliant writer, arranger, player. For him to not play music would be a, a great sin to me. So he eventually, you know, went on, played with the Dovells and, and then we started the Jukes, so right. uh, he, we go way back, teenagers. Where do you and Max Weinberg connect? By the Ma way, he was sitting in that seat. We right. Were, we, did you ever see that show? You didn't see that we got Max Weinberg. Did you ever see that one-on-one -on -one interview I did with him? No, I did not see it. I'm make sure I send it to you. I mean, he was great. He was great. Yeah, he's a great he's, guy. He's a good guy. He knows a lot about drumming and a lot about music. He he's should studied be. it. He, he wasn't just going to be a complacent musician. You know? What was your connection with him? He came into the band after Boom Carter, Ernie Carter, and Davey Sanchez left. Uh, Roy Bitten and Max came into Bruce's band, the E Street Band. And we always got along. I mean, it was always one of those things where, you know, these are the guys backstage. So that's where I first met him when I saw him play with Bruce. You know, it's so interesting. You were teasing me before we got on the air. Because as I, told, I was telling you what an honor it is to have you here, which it is. And you were teasing me that you remember some of my work from another network. And I was saying to you that, you know, I was trying to, I was hoping people forgot that work. But, but <laughs> Why? It, it was great. That's, that's another story. But here's the point. Staying relevant, staying in the game, whether it's broadcasting, or in your case, being an extraordinary musician and entrepreneur, because you are, to stay in this game, yeah, to be at the top of your game. Describe that for people who say, I'm looking for my big brick. That's not what it's been for you. You just stayed no. in the game. It's just bulldog tenacity. It's just the desire to go out and make it happen no matter what the, you know, I mean, we've played to, we did a show one time in Chicago and the owner of the club had gone to prison two weeks before we got there for things. And so there was no advertising. And we had 11 guys in the band at that time and there were 10 people in the audience. So we outnumbered the audience. But by the third night, it was full, and that's because. what you have to do, because you go out there and pound it and do the best you can, and, and you get excited about it. You, you go out there and say, this is my chance to make music, and you go out and make music. You don't just play the songs. You don't just go through the motions. You find something different every Friday, Saturday night back then, or, or Tuesday night, and you make a name for yourself by being somebody who's always working hard to do what he does. And then you just hold on through the bad times. You know, stay with that for a second. The Jukes, right? Yes. Your, your, your guys. My guys. Because it's, it's, it's interesting because you still have the passion. Yes. No signs of any waning of that. Well, some days. <laughs> some days, yeah. Well, join the club, right? <laughs> you know. But it was like that back then, too. It's like, oh, you know, you got the flu, you're on the road, you're tired, you haven't seen your girlfriend in, in six months. But you know, you're going to have paid. those moments when you go, oh, yeah. I just can't, I can't do it. But the only way to get paid That's is the way I'll do the gig. Yeah. That being said, here's my thing. Keeping the jukes together, keeping your band together, how much of that has been on you as Southside Johnny? You're the guy. Well, you have to constantly be aware that the musicians need their space too. I mean, we have a situation where anybody in my band can come to me and say, I got a better offer to go play with somebody for six months. Yes. As long as they get me a good sub, they can come back and get the gig. So that's so there's a loyalty that goes both ways there. Uh, my great saxophone player, John Isley, is going to be with Diana Ross New Year's in uh, Singapore, I think it is. So won't be with you at so the State Theater. Me. But I know that he's got me a guy who can do the gig and has already done it a couple and of times. And you're okay with that? Yes. Because if you don't get me a good sub, you're out. But if you do get me a good sub, that's all you need to do. So, 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 so the word leader in band leader, take out the musician part and go to the leader part. 
Listen, in all candor, it's a struggle. You do what we do. You, you, you get upset sometimes. How do you, <laughs> no, you're making a face, right? A couple hours ago, I got upset about something that happened here. You got to manage your emotions. How do you manage your emotions so that you keep everybody in a good frame of mind? I don't. <laughs> I am notorious. What does that mean? I'm notorious for screaming and yelling. No, I do not believe that. No, it's true. And throwing oh, things. Oh, I've tried oh, to what combat. kinds of things? Uh, I once broke $1,800 <laughs> worth of uh, microphone, I mean, uh, speakers in the monitors because the monitors were so crappy. And uh, Equipment not working bothers you. Oh. And you don't handle it well? No. After 40 years, you don't handle that well? No. I, I, here's the way <laughs> I think of it. This guy over here is running the monitors, is ruining those people's entertainment by making me unhappy. So it's his fault, and, you know. That's the way it goes, and then things start flying, harmonicas start, start flying over there. You're a perfectionist. I just, I'm not, I don't like somebody getting between me and the audience. I, What's I What's the thing between that. you and the audience? Well, it's like when you have a cameraman on stage, we've done those kind of things. There was one time in Germany where they said, we're gonna have a four camera shoot. I said, okay, stay off the stage, or, you know, stay away from me. <laughs> stay away from me. Stay away from me, <laughs> and the guy got down right down in here, and I blew up. And it was fine blow up. I started screaming and cursing, and you know, and uh, <laughs> and they got it all on camera, of course. <laughs> oh man, I love it. I got a couple. But of you know that it, what you, that goes to the passion you have for getting the job done, but also yeah. for enjoying it. Because if I'm not enjoying it, I know it's going to be tough for the audience to enjoy it. If I'm having a great time, they're usually having a great time. Yeah. Minute left. Any sign of you saying? I'm done. It crosses my mind. I mean, I'm 66 now, uh, but I'm still healthy. I still think I'm 18 years old. I still, the music cranks up and it doesn't matter what kind of mood I'm in or how I feel. I want to go and I want to sing and I want to play and I want to goof around with the guys. I want to hear them play. They all know that they could bring whatever they want to each song. They don't mm. have to play the same thing time after time. So you find the heart of the night and that's where you just sink into it and love it. I said it before you uh, sat down. I'll say it again. You honor us by being here. Southside Johnny. Uh, Southside Johnny and the Asbury Jukes. He is playing with his team. You'll see this before and after uh, at the State Theater, beautiful State Theater in New Brunswick, New Year's Eve. And also B.B. King's on January 9th. You'll see it before the show and as well as after. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us at thank beautiful you. NJ Pack. It's my pleasure. Thank you. You have an open invitation. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, in cooperation with NJTV, and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One-on-One -on -One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, TD Bank, the New Jersey Education Association, Cone Resnick, the Fidelco Group, NJ Best, and by Josh S. Weston. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, Small News, Big News, True Jersey, and by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. When you work in a public school, you're a part of the community. So when Superstorm Sandy hit, the school employees jump right in to help. The middle school here served as a refuge for people who were forced from their homes. We all pitched in to help. Custodians, cafeteria workers, teacher aides, mechanics, groundskeepers, all pitching in to help out. School employees are part of a team, whether it's to help educate our children or to recover from a terrible tragedy. That's why I'm so proud to be a member of the NJEA.